I'm back to find the answers to mankind's biggest mysteries. Not Stonehenge or what happened to Jimmy Hoffa, but the real story, the myth behind what is, what really happened to Bill McFadden's finger. Today on Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips, brought to you by ProPlan Nutrition That Performs. Hi there, I'm here with Bill McFadden from Acampo, California, right? Yeah, okay, excellent. We all know Bill. Bill's a world-renowned handler. He's uh, handled multiple Best in Show winners at Westminster, and uh, I've known Bill for a million years as well as, as anybody else. Taffy, his wife, is Canadian, and I, as a youngster, we knew her all, until Bill stole her. And then gone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have Bill here today. Thanks for coming for us, Bill. Um, I'm going to start at the begin- right at the beginning. How did you get involved in dogs, Bill? Um, well, I've had different stories over the years, but when I really think about it, my parents gave me a rough collie for my fifth birthday. And that was when Lassie was the big show on TV. And, and um, every Saturday, I would spend a couple hours brushing that dog out and then taking them on a long walk, different routes every time, just so that people would tell me how beautiful it was. So it took me a few years to figure out that, hey, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, but as far as actually get started showing dogs, I had some friends that, that had a, uh, a St. Bernard and a Great Dane, and uh, they told me that they were show dogs and they were gonna be going to a dog show and did I wanna go? And I said, sure, it sounds like fun. It was the middle of winter. So we climbed into a Vega hatchback. There was a couple. They sat in the front. I was in the back with the Great Dane and the St. Bernard in the middle of them. And we drove through an ice storm to what is now the Rose City Classic in Portland, Oregon. And um, I mean, I just, I felt like I had found my place. And um, I remember... I, I get his name wrong, but a Springer went best in show that Ray McGinnis was showing. It was a, one of the Goodwill dogs. And um, I love that dog. That's still, because of that, that's still my favorite breed. I just, Springers, there's something about them that I just love. And um, I can remember the exact place where he was grooming him at. You know, every time I go there, they've changed the building. They've built onto it, but there's still a portion of the old building and I know exactly where it was he was grooming on him. And so I came home and I bought a Dog World magazine. What year was that, Bill? Sorry. That was, I graduated from high school in 76. So it was probably, it might've been the winter of 77. Go ahead. Um, so I bought a Dog World magazine and I went to all the ads, you know, the display ads, the classified ads, the only ad for my town, I lived in Yakima, Washington, was this place that had some Karen Terriers for sale. So it turned out we had had Karens from these people. It, they had a kennel on the road. My mom was a teacher and the road that she drove to her school, there was this kennel that had three big pens out front. There was always Irish setters. There was always um, chows and there was always Karens. That's what they sold. So we got my mom had bought us a couple of years before. And so it ended up being these same people. And they were actually handlers. Um, uh, t- um, mm-hmm. I won't say his name now. McCormick was our last name. Um, gosh, how can I forget that? Anyhow, he'd won a group at the garden with a Springer. And um, their kennel name was El Mac. And I bought two Karens a mother and a daughter, four years and two years. The mother came in season a week later and I did just what you're supposed to do. I bred her. They told me to call Stella Newby in Canada. I called her. My mother drove me up there, or no, my mother drove the dog up there, got it bred, had the litter. There were four puppies, three champions, two best in show winners, and that's how I got started, which it, it hooks you really fast, but it's really, 
<laughs> there's there's um, a lot of disappointment when you find out that not every litter has a best in show winner in it. <laughs> but um, uh, anyhow, and that, my uh, relationship with Ubi, who was a wonderful uh, handler, an English lady that handled in British Columbia, um, that's how I met Taffy because I went up there to to show one of the dogs, and I stayed with Stella, and I saw Taffy at a show on the island, on Vancouver Island. And I mean, I can remember, and we never spoke, but I can remember, I was like, whoa, I didn't know they had those at dog shows. And um, that's, the rest is mystery, mystery <laughs> blistery. So, <laughs> good. Mentors, what about mentors for you? I know you mentioned Stella. Yeah, you know what? Um, I worked for two handlers, so definitely they had a big influence on me. Uh, the first was George Ward, who I'd never heard of. Um, but I mean, I was I was so new. Um, I was working in Spokane, Washington, and Dennis Springer lived there. He was a terrier handler, and he told me you should go work for George Ward. And I was like, "Who's George Ward?" And he kind of helped me arrange the whole thing. And I'd never been on a plane before, and uh, mom <laughs> suggested that I wear a suit so I got all suited up with a tie and everything and flew off to Kalamazoo Michigan and I still can remember George's face when he saw this bean pole coming down the escalator <laughs> with a suit and tie on um, so I stayed there um, not I stayed there less than a year it was probably about 10 months I got super homesick I'd never been away from home and um, so I went home because I wanted to go back to college and I got home. I mean, I was home a day and I was like, oh, didn't I just tell him I wanted to go home for Christmas? I went home Christmas Eve. So I, you know, I could have just said, can I go home for Christmas for a week? But no, I said I was going to college. So I went to college and that didn't work out so well because I, now I was so hooked on dog shows that I was working full time, going to college full time and going to dog shows on the weekend and something had to give. It was college. You know? so, one, one of my first big mistakes in life. But that's, that's how I started. And who else did you work for then? I worked. So after I came back for, to go to school, um, I met Eddie and Leslie boys. I don't remember how I met them. I think I just saw them at a dog show. And um, they, they did a lot of winning. And so I called them after I saw them one weekend and ask them if it would be possible for me to work for them at Great Western. And I didn't know that those kind of weekends, you would take anybody <laughs> to work for you, you know, when you have those big weekends. I, I just felt so honored that they really thought that I could, could uh, help them. And so I flew down there, uh, fell in love with Leslie. They lived in Malibu. You could see the ocean. I mean, it, I fell in love with everything. And so we had a fun weekend. I loved it. Um, and when I got home, I was like, I, I really think I want to do that. So I called them and I said, do you think it'd be possible to work full time for you? And um, Great Western was in June. And I just remember driving in August with Shelly. It was Shelly Green at the time. She worked for Timmy Brazier, who lived in Malibu. And somehow she drove me in, a, in my van that had no air conditioning with a litter of puppies. And my, I can't remember how many dogs I had, but we drove through the hot, like 110 degree California summer, sweating and arrived in Malibu. And it was like, nice in Malibu. <laughs> it wasn't 110. And that's, I stayed there for two years and had a, uh, learned a lot of things. Some of them about dogs <laughs> and a lot not, but um, they still, I mean, they feel like, Leslie feels like a, a big sister to me. Eddie feels like a dad kind of, or an uncle. I just was up and saw them uh, a couple weeks ago. And so they were a super big influence, not, not just themselves, but just the world that they opened up, the people that they knew. Um, and uh, as far as mentors go, I, I just feel like there's so many people if you keep your eyes open and your ears open, you get mentored all the time. We traveled quite a bit with Maripi 
Waldridge when, when Taffy and I were first married. And I, you know, Rippy's a very, um, she's a distinct individual. There aren't, you only have, if you're lucky, you have one Rippy in your life. And so I, things that she taught me, she had a way of, of saying them that really stuck with me. And I, I mean, I really, Eddie wasn't really a teacher. I had to just watch. Yeah. And um, Marippi could, was able to articulate what she was doing, why she was doing it. And that, so a lot of those things stick with me. Um, the other people, I, I've been lucky to be friends with Andy Linton since I first started. And he, he really, the first really good dog I had, he kind of took me under his wing. He had just gone best in show with Andy at the garden. So he was, he had kind of been through what it was like to campaign a dog like that. And, and he was so helpful, just like, no, 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 go this way. <laughs> you know, no, I think you should go this way. Which was that dog you were talking about? Uh, it was a Kerry Blue, and his name was um, Caragines Hotspur. Oh, he yeah. won the group at the Garden. That was my first group at the Garden. And before that, there was a Wheaton dog, didn't you? No, that was my first, I think it was my first place <laughs> at the Garden, was the group. And I mixed up. Um, and, um, and yeah, he was a fun dog, and, and um, it was a fun time. Pat, Pat Craig had Kalista, her Elkhound bitch in California. Corky had Iron Eyes, Bouvier. And so it was just, they were such good competitors. And I didn't know that, I mean, I just thought it was fun. It was like, oh, I know these people. One of us wins every day. And it was just so much fun. And they, they didn't hate me yet. <laughs> you know, they were like, oh, he's a nice kid. But it was, it was really fun um, just learning how to, you know, figure out what shows to go to, learning how to keep your dog's brain and, and uh, as well as, as physically and, and uh, coat-wise to be ready to compete. And, um, it, and th those were really two super competitors. I mean, they wanted to win, but they were so supportive, and I never felt like they didn't want me there. Well, they might not have, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you, had a, you had a million dogs you've shown and, and done well with. Who would you, do you have a favorite dog? Um, my two favorite dogs I ever showed, neither one of them did a lot of winning, but they were both herding dogs. They were both bitches. One was a Pooley from the famous um, cord maker kennel in, in Australia. Her name was Billy. I won the national with her. I won a couple, actually one of my assistants won a best in show honor and I won a best in show honor. And then I had another, uh, I had a Bouvier bitch named Emmy. Tara's too hot to handle. And I think I won five bests. I won the national under Annie, but I don't know. There was something about those two that I just loved showing. Um, they just, to this day, I just remember enjoying them so much. So that, you, you know, showing a dog, a, a terrier is a little bit more, um, particularly back then, it was a little bit more guarded experience. You know, you had to make sure it wasn't just what your dog was doing. You had to make sure that somebody else wasn't, um, accidentally or intentionally <laughs> trying to cause a problem. So it never felt as relaxed as showing those two breeding um, bitches. So they were fun. <laughs> you have a favorite breed then? I still, I love Springers, but I breed wires and I'm, I've never done drugs, but I'm thinking it must be the kind of addiction a drug addict feels because I, I just love them. And I, I love breeding them. I love the puppies. I love when they, when they're a finished product um, and they're not easy um, to, to breed good ones. It's not easy. It's kind of a, a little bit of a minefield. Can you tell me the, the story of Mick at all? Um, my story of Mick, and I always feel, ba feel bad because, you know, Mick gets associated with me and Mick had a really successful career in England with, with Michael Code and Jeff Porsche. Um, he went best in show crufts. But my experience with him was um, I have a really good friend, client named Nancy Hahn, who breeds Carries and has bred Bedlingtons. And she went to England and she came back and was telling me about this young dog she saw. And her superlatives were just too, bit, too much. I was like, no, if you're going to tell me about this neck or 
or you know just keep emphasizing one thing then it's not a balanced dog that's what i thought and i was just kind of yeah right mm -hmm. carry blue dogs they're not real pretty from about four months until about two years old they're very kind of rangy looking dogs and um, i just i didn't pay much attention to her but i started hearing just through the grapevine about this dog and this was before the internet was so you know, made, made it so easily accessible to watch dog shows all over the world. But I kept hearing stories about this Carrie dog and he was really taking off in England. And, and then finally he had a year, I don't know if any dogs ever had a year like he had, they don't have as many shows as we do, but he won, um, whatever, he won a majority of them in one year, it was kind of unheard of. And so I talked to a client that was interested and um, so I, and I'd been talking to the owners, I just blind called them and um, went to see him. And, and I thought I had the deal all set up. Um, I knew I had my part. So I brought my clients, we get over there for crafts. The, the breeders, they just hardly spoke to me. I mean, they were like, they kind of said, can you just sit down so people don't see you because he'll lose the breed if they think he's going to America. And so I went and sat and watched wires, which were right next door. And every once in a while I'd stand up when I'd see something kind of catch my eye. And, and um, to be honest with you, I wasn't that um, smitten with him right from the beginning. There was a son of his in there that was just really a beautiful dog and like really well trained, really performing, and I kept looking at him. and And Mick was he was a little bit all over the place. And to be fair, he was being shown by he was regularly shown by Jeff Korsh, but he was being shown by his partner Michael because um, Jeff was judging. He was judging Westies that year, so so Michael, you can imagine the pressure that that he was under. So I don't know that that was the performance that he, he always gave, but it, it, it wasn't, I mean, he was pretty, but it wasn't, I mean, I was like, really, this is, this is what everybody's so crazy about. Well, the people continued the whole day. The breeders just were really tight lipped, you know, didn't, I mean, I was like, okay, I think I've really screwed up. And I started thinking, well, maybe I can get the sun. And then he went best in show that night um and so i went over where the whole they were all celebrating and and again i just really felt like i kind of got a cold shoulder and and i knew peter green was there and you know that there were people telling me that you know peter's here to get the carry and and i was like well i don't know what to tell you i i i only know that i've spoken to the people and they told me they wanted me to have them and and all this so it really i he went best in show. Um, we went back to our hotel. I went back to America. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't know where we stood. I really didn't. And um, I mean, Peter Green's a hard person to compete against. That's his home turf as far as, you know, the country. So if I really felt that if he wanted him, he was going to get him. Um, and I really don't remember the rest of the story. I just remember you know, I would call them and they just kept telling me um, that he couldn't come right away because there was so much PR stuff there. You know, I think there was some bank that that they had to go, or maybe I'm thinking of Canada now <laughs> from those old years when, when you had to go be in the bank lobbies, <laughs> or at least that's what Daffy says. Um, anyhow, there were PR um, commitments, including a painting, I believe, that so he had to stay so the artist could could do the painting. And so finally, I really don't know how or what, but I finally, they said that I, he was good, I could have him. And so I went over and I got him and flew home with him. And I first had to meet him. I'd never even touched him. So I went to their house and I went and they had me sit in the living room and they went to get him and this dog walked in and I mean, he just, like, he looked right through me in their living room. There's not another dog around. He just got all puffed up and he just walked up to me. And I mean, I could literally just, it wasn't like his hair standing up. It was like my blood went cold. And, and as, as it was not intimidating, but it was, 
um, I remember just thinking, whoa, this is like a king. And he's just so, he's just got it. And, but at the same time, I felt like I knew him. I mean, it was like, it was weird. I, I, I felt like he, he knew me too. So anyhow, I brought him home. We had to change planes in, in uh, Philadelphia, I think, for some reason. And Taffy was at a show. I may be getting this all wrong, but this could be a good story. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, uh, I think we were, she was at a show in Arizona. So I flew home with them. I get to the Phoenix and they're like, um, sir, your dog's in Philadelphia. <laughs> and they had paid a lot of money. The people had paid a lot of money for him at that time, or it certainly it was more money than I thought anybody would ever pay for a dog for me to show. Um, and I'm just like, okay, but I mean, here I have this dog that made me pee in my pants when he looked at me, what's he gonna do with people at a kennel in Philadelphia? I don't know. But um, long story short, he got to us in Arizona. We didn't tell anybody that story. Um, and so I took him home from the shows and every day I took him to a park and I just walked him like two miles just so we could get used to each other, just build a friendship kind of, and I get used to what gate he was comfortable in. And um, then I entered him at Great Western, which at the time was, it, it didn't rival Montgomery, but it was getting up to where the entries would be like 1,500, 1,600 terriers. And it was spectacular. It was held on a, on a, um, a soccer field at a college in Long Beach. Um, I mean, as beautiful a dog show as you could find it, just the way it was set up and, and terrier people. I mean, we all, we miss it. It's not, it's not held there any longer, but it was really um, a special, special place. And um, so I brought him there and I always get the, the days mixed up and Lydia Hutchinson, usually I get it mixed up, not in her favor, but I think that, she was the, she did the group. I'm not even going to say any names just <laughs> because I'll make somebody upset. Anyhow, he, uh, he went best in show from the classes the first day and really caused a, a stir at the dog shows. I mean, he was really well received. And um, then the next day he, he went again from the classes. That day was under Kim McDermott. And I'm pretty sure the first day was under Lydia because I know I said it was Ken one, one time and he said, no, no, I was the first one. <laughs> um, and it wasn't just the wins. It was like, um, it, it was just like, it seemed like the whole dog show was all about Mick. It was just like, and not in a negative way, you know, how, how it feels well when someone thinks you have a good dog and they all come to figure out how they're going to beat you. It didn't, it felt like, um, I don't know, it just was, it felt like everybody was acknowledging him. And so, and then he wasn't entered on, he wasn't entered on Sunday because I just wanted to try him out. I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I just wanted to see how he showed, um, and he showed amazing. <laughs> I mean, uh, but so he wasn't entered on Sunday and and I didn't enter him anywhere until Montgomery weekend. And that was 2000. And it was the year that they, they brought back uh, Morrison Essex. That was the first year that they brought it back. And um, so there'd been a little talk about Mick. You know, people had heard about the Great Western. And of course, he had a reputation beforehand. But I took him to back to Morrison Essex and... Um, I'm, it was just, I mean, I can't even, I mean, try, just trying to win the breed from the classes at Montgomery is, is difficult because there's good entries. The special class is big. So, you know, I was hoping I could, but, but also realizing that a lot of great dogs go best of winners because, you know, judges sometimes aren't quite confident enough. And, um, well, that didn't happen. He won the breed and, um, and then he won the group. And then in Best in Show, um, it started to rain just a little bit, just misty kind of, just a little light drizzle. 
And that happens to be you know, my favorite weather to show Carrie Blues in because it just kind of sets her coat down and it's so pretty. And it got dark, it was under lights. And um, I, it just, he went best in show. <laughs> and <laughs> just, um, it, it was super special. It was just, you know, you just can't plan things like that. Oh, for sure. And you still talk to people this day. The guy was talking to Wayne not too long ago, and he touts Mick as the best dog he's ever seen. And Wayne's seen a lot of dogs. So. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he was a super, super good dog. Um, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a bragger, so I, I'm not going to say he was a super great dog because that sounds like a jerk. But, um, he, you know, he had places that I would have changed him. Oh, but, sure. but what Mrs. Clark told me one time that um, – all dogs have faults, but she said great dogs carry their faults well. And so that, I always thought, okay, yeah, I would change him. But if changing him changed him, then I don't want to change him. So, so um, yeah, he was, he was a cool dog. Yeah, there's no question about that. We all enjoyed watching him. What about um, any advice for new handlers? Um, have a backup plan, as we're, <laughs> we all have figured out right now. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not one of the people who thinks there are no, no, pe no good young people and dogs anymore. I, I'm the opposite. I think there are so many talented young people. Um, I think there aren't as many um, what we what we used to call backers, you know, people that you just could kind of go and show a, a great dog of any breed, and that they might be interested in 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 helping support that kind of a career. Um, but I think there's a lot of super talented people, and um, I still feel like a kid until I look in the mirror. So you know, I don't realize when when kids talk to me that it's probably like you or I talking to to Rick Tashudian or, or Annie Clark or whatever. I mean, not that I feel that I'm in that level of Annie Clark, but you know what I mean? I, I just feel like I'm still trying to figure out how to, <laughs> to make this work. But uh, I think there's some really super kids and, um, and some that are so interested in, in the history of the, of the sport and of their, the breeds that they're interested in. And, um, and I think it may have always been that way because I know when I was starting out, I would hear people saying, you know, that dogs aren't like they used to be and the dogs used to be better. And I think there's a little bit of a, a cyclical um, thing that goes on with people that uh, they always, and it's not just in dogs. I think people just always kind of think it, it used to be better. And, you know, I, I can remember um, other times in my life where older people would, would talk about, you know, the United States or the world, you know, how things are going and, and, so I think there have always been worry warts, people that think things aren't, aren't doing well. Um, I, I hope that, that dog shows continue because I know there's a lot of people, a lot of young people, a lot of not so young people that really love it and are really invested in it and passionate about it. And, and I really, I love seeing that. I love seeing the people that feel that way. Thank you for that answer. Um, a skill or talent that uh, all of us wouldn't be aware of that you possess. I play the tuba. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. You still? Uh, well, I played it in high school in the marching band. Um, and then years later, when I found out that, do you remember Joe Tacker? Of course you remember Joe Tacker. Joe Tacker, when he found out that I played tuba, he signed up in the Club of America and I would get a quarterly did you hear that um, I missed that part what did he say me up in the tuba club of America and it has like a quarterly magazine that comes out just like a dog magazine it's, there's pictures of tubas and tuba players and I he wanted me he, there was a hundred tuba band that he wanted me to join and yeah, I didn't do it because I haven't played tuba since I was in high school. <laughs> That's been a while ago. You but, have yeah, that. Do I have one? No. Do you? No. <laughs> no. Uh, um, superstitions. What superstitions do you have, Bill? Um, I always pee in the same urinal 
Like if I, <laughs> like if I go in and I'm like, no, no, that's my, turn. come back in. <laughs> and I also, if they are, if there's four urinals, I figure out which one's first. <laughs> and I always pee in first. And if there's one of those little for the short people or maybe children, um, I always think that that's for reserve best in show. So I never pee in that one. All right. <laughs> that's a good one. I have, I, have, I have yet to come across. And also, I'm really, I'm really into, I'm superstitious about pennies. I love lucky pennies. So I always, if I find a penny, I always thought I'm like, oh my God, we got it. It's, it's stupid that I'm superstitious about pennies. What if that penny's in your urinal? That, I would have to get one of my assistants to get it out. <laughs> Although I'm getting used to wearing gloves, so maybe I'll just keep a glove in my pocket, so just in case. With all this time off, what have you been doing? Um, we have been, Taffy and I have been doing a lot of yard work and a lot of cleaning closets, a lot of organizing, a lot of purging, ex which is now in piles everywhere because there's no place to donate it to this open. So, so we've been doing a lot of that. Um, uh, sleeping more than I usually do. And although we've had a couple conversations in the middle of the night, but I'm like, why am I awake right now? I don't know, but. That's why. Um, my time is different from yours. So I see you back and you're like, what are you doing up, Bill? <laughs> I don't know, that's crazy. Um, yeah, and you know, we're trying to figure out a couple different ways to make some some bucks until this all gets going again. So I've been putting some some thought into that. Um, any thoughts on today's judging process? How thing how how our judges are being moved forward or moved or held back or even applying? Well, I think it's it's tough. I mean, I, I'm nervous about applying because I just don't um so I, some people are, can just like retain, they read a standard and they can retain, retain the verbiage, you know, almost spot on uh, and uh, are able to draw it up and they aren't always able to um, apply it. Uh, but if you talk to them, it's hard to say that they don't know, yeah, exactly. you know, the three because they can, you know, they can quote, you know, line verse and chapter kind of thing. Um, and I just don't really think that I, there's nothing wrong. And I'm sure there's some people that have that ability that also are able to apply it. But I just think um, a good dog person, a good animal person, it can, it's, it can come from anywhere. I mean, some people just have a real natural eye and some people have spent years um, working and developing their eye. And some people, never have an eye. <laughs> I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. And I'm sure that happens in a, a lot of different other um, artistic endeavors. I mean, I, I know um, I would love to be able to paint or sculpt. And I'm lucky if you can read my writing to see that I signed a check, you know, I'm just, it's not something that translates for me. And I really, I love to look at, I love people that are, are good at, at that. Um, and I think the process is hard and I think it's expensive and I think it takes a long time. And I think there's some really good people in our sport that could be used to, to seek out the people that, that really would be an asset that people would want to show to. Um, and a lot of those people, particularly in the terrier group, I think there are a lot of um, great, great handlers, great dog people that, that never, applied and I don't know I think some of its pride I think some of them felt that they deserve to just be asked or um, and I think some of them uh, it may be education it may be um, as simple as uh, what's that called where you see things backwards um, just like dyslexia you know what I mean some people the the I think they're just intimidated by the paperwork part of it sure. Yeah. And then to be tested by people that don't um, really know, I, I think that that is a little, um, 
I don't even know the right word and I don't have a sorry system in front of me, but I just think that it's a, it's probably an ego thing, but I think it's a little bit insulting sometimes to have uh, somebody who spent their life doing something being tested by somebody who's doesn't have that kind of background. I agree with that. And no matter how, I mean, they they could be very well meaning and, and all that, but it's just, it's a, I think it, it puts some people off. All right. So one last question, Bill. Okay. There, there's been many stories and most of them, I think have been fabricated from you. Um, but people, <laughs> I think you know where I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> I was asked to ask, how you lost your finger. I want at least two of the stories. Two of the stories. Well, one is not suitable. Oh. I can't. Okay. Is that but, the um, Huh? Is that the, is that the book? Which, which one's the real story then? <laughs> the real story is I was rock hunting. What the rocks did to me that I wanted to hunt them, I don't know. But I was climbing up the side of a hill. And I was with my cousin and my brother. My brother was above me. My cousin was next to me. My brother dislodged a boulder. It was heading toward my cousin. So I put my hand on a boulder and shoved my cousin and the boulder ricocheted and smashed my hand. That's the true story. Ouch. Yeah, but I've had lots of fun ones. And yeah. for some, I've never said it was a Rottweiler, but I've heard a lot of people, then they really thought it was a Rottweiler that bit it off. The Rottweiler would take the whole hand. <laughs> it, wouldn't settle, it wouldn't settle for one finger. No, but. No, I think you're probably referring to a one about Gretchen, and it's. Are you? <laughs> no, I don't. I was, I was uh, just asked by certain people to ask about the finger story. I I don't think I really have ever made up a story, but <laughs> other people I have not didn't denied them. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember one one year. I think we were we were in Michigan. I don't even know why we were at the same dinner table and. The waiter came over and you you ordered a rusty squirrel. Do you remember that night? <laughs> What's a rusty squirrel? <laughs> I can't imagine you do. I, I thought it was hilarious though because the the woman said, "I don't know what a rusty squirrel is," and he, you said, "Neither do I." But maybe. <laughs> okay. I, I, still, I still don't. <laughs> That's funny. It stuck with me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I had um, some Westie clients once that were relatively new and they were trying to learn how to groom. And they told me one time that that they would bend their finger over because there was something about what I would do when I would stroke down the neck. I would pick up the hair and I would put my hand down and they thought that there was some secret, like having, there was a benefit to being without a finger. Uh -huh. I was like, nope, that's all I got. That's all I got to work <laughs> Well, it was a good story. <laughs> and now we all know the real stories. The real story. I can't do anything outlandish now. Well, thank you, Bill. I really appreciate your time. And we went through a few technical difficulties, but I think it worked out great. Um, okay, excellent. That's good talking. You're well, and I hope Taft is well, and you guys are getting through this crazy time. I look forward to seeing you when we get through the other side. Somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> All right, I'll probably, I'll probably talk to you some early morning at some point. All okay. right. All right, thanks, Will. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Bill. That was an interesting half hour or so. Thanks for inviting us into your home. If you like what we're doing here, and I'm sure that you do, please press the like, share, and subscribe button below. And don't forget to check out our other videos in our library at Will, uh, Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips. You'll see trainings, and you'll see other interviews, and some infamous wake-up calls. And don't forget, if you want to see something, just drop me a line at dogshowtips at gmail.com. Until then... Ciao for now.